the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from one of our special guests. This is our home church. We're not able to live here as we believe we will be able to someday. We're in the process of transitioning. That may take some time, but we're on our way. This is our home church, and we're thankful to God for you and for it. And uh, praise the Lord. I'm excited about the message I have in my heart to share. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible apps, Bible smartphones, dumb phones, whatever else has a Bible app on there, then let's open up this evening. We'll start with... Acts chapter 16, what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about a message that I have come to call the things we must do for God. The things we must do for God. Uh, As Pastor mentioned a moment ago, we don't stand in a pastoral office, we stand in an apostolic office and we're always thinking foundational, thinking how can we lay a foundation, how can we protect the, the foundation that we lay. That's what we do. You know, we pastor pastors and we help them establish churches and, and keep them going. And I'm always uh, very, very interested in looking at the scriptures from a, a perspective of longevity. We are not running a 100-meter dash, my friends. We are running a race for the rest of our lives. And we need to know how to maximize the life that we live because this is a one-time shot. You don't get a second chance to go around and make good on all the things you were intending to do the first time through and never got around to doing them for the the Lord, of course. And so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about things we must do in this life. The Bible has things to say about this. The common denominator here tonight will be the word must, M-U-S-T. If I say to you, you must see me after service. Because I'm using the word must, I am conveying to you a sense of urgency, a sense of importance. You're being informed that I really want to see you and you don't need to be somewhere else. We must talk. If I choose to use that word, then I am by the choice of that word letting you know that it's important we get together. And you should understand that. And that's what the scriptures are going to talk to us about here tonight about seven things we must do for the Lord. Now, we're going to take a quick treatment for all of these. Obviously, each of these could be expounded upon in greater detail, but for the sake of time, we'll just hit on each one of them and give you something to pray over and to study in your own time before the Lord. So let's go to Acts uh, chapter 16, and we'll begin reading in verse number 25, and we're going to read down to the end of verse 31 just to read the context of where we're going. Verse 25 is where we'll start. It says, At midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Verse 26. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Verse 29, then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Verse 30, and he brought them out and said, and here's the question. This is the first of the seven things we must know to do for God. What must I do to be saved? That's the question. What must I do? Not what I should do, not what someone thinks I should do, but what must I do to be saved? And the reason we start here is because without salvation, nothing else matters. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what you accomplish. It doesn't matter how much money you acquire, how many things you buy, what kind of a quality of life you have. Who knows? But without Jesus, your life is a waste of time. So we start with this. This is the question for all time. This is the question for all generations, for all ages. What must I do to be saved? There's all kinds of religions out there. There's all kinds of man-made opportunities and man-made organizations and man-made plans to tell you what they think you ought to do. But what does the Bible tell us? The next verse gives us the answer. The answer comes back from the Apostle Paul. He says in verse number 31... Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. That's where we start. What must I do to be saved? That is our message. 
After we receive Jesus, this is the message we are commissioned to share. Everywhere we're sent by the Holy Ghost, that is how we are to answer that question. Okay? Now, you know, in our politically correct circles in our society, where we're at right now with uh, everything being the way it is, people are working very hard to convince us there's all kinds of ways. There's all kinds of methods. There's all kinds of opportunities. There's all kinds of avenues and, 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 and routes that we can take to get to heaven. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says there's only one way, and his name is Jesus. Can anyone say amen? amen. Paul didn't say, well, yeah, there's, a, there's several options you have here. I mean, that's not how he answered. He said there's one way, and it's to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, the reason that this is a very narrow-minded message is because nobody else paid for our sins. You know, we forget why we're saved. We're saved because somebody paid for our sins when we couldn't pay for them for ourselves. And that was Jesus. He paid. The reason that his blood is on a mercy seat and not Mohammed's or Buddha's or some Hindu priest or someone out there, the reason his blood sits on that mercy seat is because he earned that. He died on a cross and took our sins. He lived a sinless life and took our sins and paid our price. Mohammed didn't pay our price. Buddha didn't pay our price. The Pope didn't pay the price. Hindus didn't pay the price. Jesus paid the price. That's why he is the way. He is not, he is not a way, the way. Thank you. Well, that's a pretty narrow concept. Thank you. It's a very narrow concept. The road is very narrow that leads to heaven is what Jesus said. So when someone says, what must I do to be saved? Tell them. Believe on Jesus. There you go. This is not rocket science. Believe on the Lord Jesus. He paid for your sins. Nobody else did. So there is no other way to get there. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Listen, it's very politically correct to, to, to uh, you know, present other options. Well, you know, God's a loving God, and how could he do this, and how could he send people to hell and all that? Listen, Jesus went so that we don't have to go. If that's not love, what is? I mean, the second person of the Trinity came down here, assumed a, a body, took upon himself the substitutionary work on a cross, and paid for our sins. What's that tell you about how much God loves us? God so loved the world, he gave us Jesus. All right? Salvation is, let me, let me back up and say it to you this way. Salvation is a gift legally purchased for all men for all time. Everybody's sins were taken care of on the cross. There's no sin issue now, but the issue is receiving the gift. It's a free choice. It's a free gift, but you have to receive it. You know, listen, I can, I can do my research and I can find out what you like and what, what kind of clothing you like to wear and stuff, and I can go down to the uh, department store and I can buy you the nicest outfit I can find, and I can have it gift wrap and put a nice bow on it, you know, and all this, and I can present to you that gift. You didn't buy the gift. I did. The gift was purchased for you, not for me, but you, you can reject it. You don't have to take it. It's a gift. I'm offering it to you, but you can say no. And this is the way salvation is. It's a gift purchased for all men, but not all men receive it. It's a choice, okay? And they need to know what they need to do. What must I do? And here's the answer. You want believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved. There is no other way. And don't let anybody tell you that there is, because there isn't. Can anyone say amen? amen? All right, that's number one. Number two, here's the second point. We must spiritually replenish ourselves. Like I mentioned a moment ago, we're running a long distance race. We must spiritually replenish ourselves. All right. You have to keep your gas tank full when it comes to the things of God. You cannot afford to cruise on last year's anointing, last year's revelation, last year's message, last year's conference. You need to, you need to keep your sword sharp. That is an ongoing responsibility. Look with me at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Let's go to 2 Timothy and look with me at chapter number 2. 2 Timothy, second chapter, verse number 6. 2 Timothy 2 and verse 6. Here's what it says. This is from the New King James Version. The hardworking farmer must... Be first to partake of the crops. The hardworking farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Now, in this setting, in the text here, the context, 
the Christian is, is described as a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. All right? And for our discussion here tonight, we're just going to look at the farmer illustration for a moment or two. We are described as hardworking farmers who must first partake of our own crops. This is what I refer to as the law of replenishment. This is where you understand the importance of keeping your sword sharp, keeping your mind renewed to the word, keeping your body under. All of this process is an ongoing, everyday discipline. It's a routine of discipline that you establish for yourself. Nobody else can do this for you except you. I can't do this for you any more than you can do this for me. We are responsible for maintaining our edge. And I've been around long enough. I've been at what I do now for Jesus for 32 years, and I've seen it. I've seen a lot. I've seen them come. I've seen them go. I've seen them rise. I've seen them fall. I've seen them shoot up like rockets, you know, and I've seen them fall and crash and burn. And what I have learned in all of this is, you know, this race, it does not go to the swift. This race goes to the consistent the people who consistently apply themselves to the spiritual effort necessary to keep their gas tank full. Listen, I can buy the sharpest, hottest sports car that they have out there, and I can fill that thing up and drive off the showroom floor, and away I go, and that car is designed to take me from coast to coast. Anywhere I want to go, that machine will take me there if I continue to put fuel in the gas tank. Now, if I don't, I'll go as far as that last fill up, and that's as far as that machine can take me. It's designed to go 150 miles an hour and do all of these wonderful things, a high-performance thing. But without the gas, it goes nowhere. And this is what happens to Christians who start cruising on yesterday's revelation. They start cruising on yesterday's church attendance and what they had from God a year ago, five years ago, ten years ago. Listen, God is always moving forward. So if you're not moving forward with him, you're actually falling behind. He's never stationary. He's always moving forward. You better be able to move with him. And that requires daily discipline, daily Bible study, daily reading, daily prayer. Don't miss church services. If this is your home church, you should be in here as often as you can get yourself in here. Just to keep the edge. Just to keep the edge. Keep your sword sharp. The more you use it, the more you have to keep it sharp. Okay? The more you run the race, the bigger the hurdles are going to get. And you're, ne- you're going to need to know how to jump these hurdles along the way, time after time, year after year. I don't know about you, but I intend to hear at the end of my life, well done, good and faithful servant. I intend to cross the finish line. And I intend to finish the race stronger than when I started. Can anyone say amen? amen? I don't need to be roped across the finish line from 50 yards out by the mercy of God. That's not the way I intend to finish running this race. I want to stretch for the tape. I want to be stronger for those last few meters of race than when I was when I got started. Amen. You must spiritually replenish yourself. This is the importance of consistency. Living by faith expends spiritual energy, just like what we're talking about here. The farmer has to partake of the crops because if he doesn't partake of the crops first, he won't have the energy to continue to plant crops. That's the whole idea. He has to first partake. He takes what he gets. He takes and he consumes first so that he's got the strength to keep on planting, to keep on harvesting, to keep on going. Amen. You can't minister to other people unless you're ministering out of the overflow of your heart. All right. If you're scrambling just to keep your own life together, that's not going to be a very convincing witness to somebody who's searching for truth. All right. Praise the Lord. We must spiritually replenish ourselves. That's number two. Number three, same chapter, 2 Timothy, back up three verses. 2 Timothy chapter 2 now and verse 3. Back up three verses to the third verse, which says, You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Point number three, we must endure hardship. Now in charismatic circles, that hardship word is almost like a curse word. Hardship, I rebuke you in Jesus' name. I reject that. I bind you. I cast you out. You know, listen, hardship. Jesus said we must endure. There's something about it that just makes you sharper. There's something about it that makes you more lethal. There's something about it that just gives you an edge that terrifies the devil and makes him nervous just because you're around, because you've been there. You've been shot at. You've gone through the ringer. You've been turned upside down and right side up a half a dozen times, and you're still in the game. 
that makes you somebody God can use. It makes you somebody that qualifies you for being meat for the master's use. And, you know, when we get people saved in the Philippines, we do our best as quickly as we can to give them the complete picture about what it means to serve Jesus. Like Pastor Jim mentioned a few minutes ago, we work on Mindanao. Mindanao is where all the fighting takes place. It's where all the kidnappings, extortion, bombings, blown up houses, blown up buildings, blown up buses, people being taken, slaughtered. That's Mindanao. This is where all the fighting takes place. My wife, uh, when she was growing up, she had to evacuate her house three times because of war. She'll talk about, she'll tell you about the time they're hiding in the basement listening to bullets whiz through the kitchen. You know, this is the kind of place we work for God. And, you know, many of our churches are in these places that are very compromised. And we've got, you know, uh, we've got soldiers with us and people with uh, guns under their shirts and all kinds of things. You know, plain clothes soldiers go along with us. We've got friends in the military, etc. This is where we do our business for God. But, you know... Uh, there's just something about knowing that you're, 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 you're pressing forward, you're moving into uncharted territory, and there's going, you're going to encounter resistance. There's something, to me at least, there's something exciting about it. Because it's in those moments you see the power of God. It's in those moments you see the miracles of God, more so than in any other atmosphere or arena. Are you listening? Hardship, difficulties. There, you know, we tell the people when, when we get them into the body of Christ, you know, the good things are here. You, you have dominion. You're, you're a child of God now. Uh, you can receive your healing. Health is promised to you. Uh, prosperity is yours. You don't have to live in poverty anymore. You can exercise dominion over the devil instead of letting him push you around. Now you can start pushing him around. All of the good stuff. And on the other side of that coin, because you are now serving Jesus, there will be a big fat target placed on your back. And the more you want to do for God, the bigger that target's going to get, and the more you're going to get shot at. You must also understand this comes with the territory. And if you put your hand to the plow and look back, you're not worthy of the rewards waiting for you at the end of the field. And then we also tell people these things, see? Look, look with me at Acts chapter 9, verse 15. Let's flip back over to the beginning of Paul's ministry when Jesus was talking to Ananias about Paul. Acts chapter number 9 and verse number 15. We'll start there. Ninth chapter of Acts and the 15th verse. Uh, The Lord's talking to Ananias here. He says to Ananias, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine, that would be Paul, to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. Now look at verse 16. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Must. He didn't say he's going, it, it might possibly happen. We're going to try and do our best to avoid this. No, that's not what he said. He said he must suffer because this man is going to be a point person to introduce the gospel into the Gentile world. And, he, and the Lord knows what kind of a, a opposition this man's going to encounter. He's telling him up front. You must understand, there will be hardship. There will be difficulties. It is not going to be easy. You are going to be swimming upstream for the rest of your life. Nothing will be handed to you. The devil will never step aside and just let you go do what you want to go do. Can anyone say amen? Do you understand what I'm talking about? I mean, you know, if you go to this church, you get the complete gospel. You go to many churches, you get something less than that. You know, this feel good, stroke me, take care of me, make me feel better about myself, the, the, the spiritual me, you know, all of this. Listen, if you go to a church that preaches the complete message, you are prepared for what lays ahead. And it's not always wonderful. It's not always great. It's not always, hey, wow, praise the Lord. It's not always that way. It wasn't that way for this guy. And, you know, someone says, well, you're going through what you're going through because you're in sin and all of this. Well, I beg to differ. I see it all through here, praise God. See, Jesus, Matthew 16, 24, Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must take up your cross. These are verses we don't, we don't preach on enough in, in charismatic circles. He said, take up your cross and follow me. Cross, cross, difficulties, challenges, hardships, resistance. Listen, it's normal to experience hardship. You need to understand this. In the gospel, it's normal. Around the world tonight, there are many, many, many thousands of people in jail because of their faith. There's people being killed for their faith. There's people dying for their faith. 
Okay, we live in a very isolated, very, uh, very protected environment in this country. We have a very limited perspective of what actually is happening around the world. But you get out there and you get in the bushes and start shaking things for Jesus, you'll find out. When you get out there and want to ma- become a player, not just a spectator, a boat rocker and a wave maker and a shaker and a mover, the devil's going to pay attention to you. Okay? Good news is there's nothing he can do you know, that will you know, ultimately uh, destroy your witness for the Lord. He can huff and puff, but he can never blow your house down. And he likes to huff and puff, but he can never blow your house down. Praise the Lord, see? Paul was told he must suffer great things in the name of Jesus. Good soldiers must know how to endure hardship. Must know how. Without caving in, questioning God, becoming offended, becoming confused, becoming disoriented. Are you listening? We're living in a fallen world, everybody. This is a cursed planet. Jesus redeemed us but the devil is still here and the curse is still down here and we will deal with things as long as we're here it's just the way it is until he comes back and everything's remade we're living in a cursed environment okay i'm thinking of one pastor friend of mine he he pastors a, a powerful church in arkansas he and his wife gave birth to a child years ago with severe autism and I'm, you know, I, I see this man once a year. I go to his church, you know, and the autistic child is on the front row, and we do our best to, you know, take care of him. And I've been around them long enough to see the challenges there. I mean, they live with this every day. This is not an easy thing. If you ever know anything about autism, you know, autistic children, I mean, this kid is a handful. But, I mean, they pastor. They, they have a marriage. They have other children. I mean, you know, it's not easy. But they understand the bigger picture. There are things that happen just because we're down here. Can anyone say Amen. It has nothing to do with our faith. It has everything to do with the environment that we're born into. The world is at war, and we're smack dab in the middle of it. All right? And we need to understand this so that we don't, you know, cave in and and, and go into an emotional cocoon every time something bad happens and we're questioning whether we're walking by faith and all of this. Listen, the Bible says, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12 says, listen, they who wish to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution, will suffer and suffering is not a popular subject, but it's a reality check for those that want to finish running the race and look back at the end of their life and see a long line of people there that wouldn't be there any other way. Amen? Praise the Lord. That's where I'm going to be. How about you? All right. Number four. Fourth point. We must continue to do what we've been taught to do. We must continue. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's go back to 2 Timothy, this time the third chapter and the 14th verse. 2 Timothy chapter number 3 and verse number 14. Paul talks to Timothy in this verse and he says, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of. You must continue in the things you've learned to do. If you've gone to this church for any appreciable length of time, you've been taught how to walk by faith and not by sight. You've been taught how to suck it up and get in the game and quit being a complainer and a whiner and, you know, just someone who just wants everything handed to you. You've been taught better than that here. Amen? Well, praise God. You know, just when you get out there and all hell is unleashed against you, don't cave in. Remember what you were taught. It's like soldiers when they're on in the battle. And they're being shot at. They're, they, they are trained to remember what they learned back in, back in basic training. The reason boot camp and basic training is so hard is because they know where these guys may end up someday. Out there in the battlefield getting shot at. You better remember what you were trained to do with a gun. You better remember how to you know, put a gun back together in the dark. Because you may be in a life and death situation where knowing how to do that is the difference between life and death. Learn and know how to walk by faith and continue to do so. That's why, in my opinion, it's, it's folly to walk away from the things that brought you to the dance. You know, people come along, you know, every so often we encounter such souls in our travels. You know, they're going to enlighten us and give us a new paradigm of theology. They're going to let us know that the faith message is extreme. The faith message doesn't work. Uh, you know, uh, you know th- there's other things, you know, the sovereignty. Well, listen, I've been doing what I do for 32 years. I left the United States with $20 in my pocket and a one-way plane ticket to the Philippines with a footlocker full of clothing and Bible notes, and that's how I started. 
There was no one there to meet me, nobody there, no, no banners, no flower around my neck thing, no trumpeteers, you know, no parade to the five-star hotel, none of this. I showed up with 20 bucks in my pocket, nothing, didn't know the language, didn't know where I was going to go, and that was 32 years ago. And from then until now, we've learned some things about how to keep our lives together, keep our head on our shoulders, and keep moving forward by faith. So when someone comes along and tells me, I've got it all wrong, I'd just like to say, you know, Tiger, if you've done what we've been doing for 32 years, I'll listen to you. You've got something to say. But don't come along with your theories and your concepts and your conference CDs that you just listen to and then tell me how to run the show. We've been doing this now for a while. We know what we're doing. Faith works. If you work it, it works. It works for me. It'll work for you. It'll work for anybody. And just because we go through a difficult patch now and then doesn't mean we throw all of this out. Because, you know, we're going through a difficult patch. Jesus went through difficult patches. Paul went through a bunch of them. James did, all of these people. But, you know, you continue to do what you've been taught to do. And that's what Paul was telling Timothy. He said, listen, continue in what you have learned. Because Timothy was under fire. Timothy was being shot at from all sides. And Paul's writing these letters to keep that man's act together. He says, you must continue in the things I've taught you, the things you've been assured of. And listen, and at the end of the verse, he says, knowing from whom you have learned them. Praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. And the reason why I respect Jim and Debbie like I do, pastors Jim and Debbie, is because they've been there. They've been shot at. They've taken the hits, and they're still here. Are you listening? People out in the congregation, when I say the, the Christian world, have no idea what it means, what it's like to run churches of this size or run ministries of this size. They have no idea the challenges involved. But listen, I can tell you, you know, I respect them. I respect people like them because we've taken the hits and we're, we're still standing. Because the things we've learned 30, 20, 30, 40 years ago are the things that sustain us when the chips are down. The truth never changes. Concepts can change. Methodology can change. But the truth never changes. Thank you, Jesus. All right. We must continue in what we have learned and been assured of. All right. Uh, let's go on for time. Number five. This time, let's jump over to Acts chapter number 27. Let's go to the book of Acts and the 27th verse. I'm sorry, 27th chapter. Acts chapter 27 and a portion of Acts chapter 28 is devoted by the Holy Spirit to a real-life storm that the Apostle Paul actually went through out on the Mediterranean Sea on his journey from Jerusalem to Rome. He was on his way to stand trial for the charge of sedition against the Roman Empire. And so they put him on a boat, stuck him on a boat, and sent him out into the, in a, into the Mediterranean. If you read the story in all of its entirety, this was a very dangerous time to go sailing. They never should have left port to begin with, but they did anyway. And so here they are. They're out there, and now they're in the middle of this hurricane, which the Bible calls Eurachlodon. This is a huge storm system. This little wind-driven boat is getting tempest-tossed all over the place. All right, And here in Acts chapter 27, verse 24, Paul shares with the sailors and soldiers a message that an angel appeared on the boat to give him from God. And this reveals point number five, which is this. We must finish our race. Must finish. And here's the verse, 27, 24. He says, do not, this is the angel talking to Paul. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. You must be brought before Caesar. Listen, if your assignment from God is not finished, there's no way the devil can take you out if you will not allow him to do so. Your day of departure is not up to the devil. Your day of departure is between you and God. When the devil comes along and tries to convince you that he's going to take you out before your time, you can tell old Splitfoot it's none of his business. When you're leaving, that's between you and God. Can anyone say amen? Yes. He's got no voice in your life. Who does he think he is? Just slap him around a little bit. He tries to torment you with these thoughts about, you know, you're, you're going to leave prematurely. Hey, you tell him, no, 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 no. Sit down and shut up. And I'm going to, you, you can just listen to me worship and praise God for an hour. How do you like that? Talk back. Talk back. You must be brought before Caesar. If I may paraphrase what God was telling the angel to tell Paul was this. Your business for me is not done. 
you have, a, you have an assignment to stand before Caesar and deliver the gospel, and you are not going to sink out here in the middle of the sea. The devil knows where you're going, and the devil knows who you're going to be talking to. So he's going to try to sink that ship before you ever reach land. And I'm here to tell you, wind, wave, storm, or screaming sailors, it doesn't matter. You will stand before Caesar. You must finish your race. Are you listening? And I tell people, you know, if you're out there and you're, and you're running your race in your lane and you're doing what God told you to do, you have every right to expect God to move heaven and earth for you. You have every right to stand your ground and rebuke the devil and refuse to depart prematurely or to step aside. Tell him, you have, you have no authority here. This is between me and my God. My ministry was called and anointed and equipped from heaven, and he'll let me know when my time is up. And he'll let me know when my race is finished, not you. Hallelujah. All right. Listen, they couldn't stop Jesus. How many times did they try to kill him? They couldn't stop him. The Bible, you know, you go back and read chapters like John chapter 8, you know. The Bible says they wanted to put their hands on him and they couldn't because his hour had not come. The one that I especially enjoy is at the end of John chapter 8. Why don't we turn there with me? I think we've got enough time. John chapter 8. Here's one example of many, but this one just blesses me because of what we read here. They tried to kill Jesus many times. They couldn't do it. They tried to kill Paul many times. They couldn't do it. They tried, but they couldn't. And they may try to take you out, and they won't be able to either. They've tried to take me out a number of times. We've had Muslim imams step up on the stage while I'm preaching and try to stab me with knives. We've had bullet, bullets fly by while we're preaching. I guess they didn't receive the message. What do you think? <laughs> they didn't like what I had to say. Had witch doctors, you know, I mean, we've had it all. But anyway, uh, John chapter 8, verse number 59, uh, verse 58, John 8, 58. The last two verses of the chapter, check these out with me. Verse 58, Jesus said to them, most assuredly I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. Now the Jews knew what he just said. He just called himself God and they knew it. Now, verse 59, then they took up stones to throw at him. But Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now, forget that number nine. Remember, the Bible was not written in chapter and verse. Can anyone say amen? amen. It was not written originally with chapter and verse markings. All of that was added centuries later for reference purposes. Jesus never walked down the road saying, verily, verily, I say unto you, men, chapter 10, <laughs> verse 6. It's not how he talked to these people. All of that was added later. That nine was put in there by people. So just take the nine out. Chapter 9, verse 1. Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned this man or his parents, that he was born blind, blah, blah, blah. He ministered healing to the man. The man got healed and so forth. But the point I want you to see with me is this. Verse 59 says this crowd that Jesus was talking to, it actually started out as a Bible study. It ended up as a heated argument, and uh, they were picking up stones to throw at him because they thought he had just committed the sin of blasphemy by calling himself God before Abraham was I am. They knew what he just said. So they picked up stones to throw at him. Look, it says, they took up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself. Now, let me ask you a question. If I say something so inflammatory to you that you hate me so much that you would like to pick up stones and throw them at me, and here I am. I'm talking to you, and you're listening, just like then, and you're going to pick up stones and throw those at me. Are you looking at me because you're the, I'm the target? I mean, if you're going to throw the stone, aren't you looking at me? I'm the target. You're going to throw the stone at me. You're not looking over here to throw the stone over there. You're going to be looking where you're going to throw the stone. That's what people do. How in the world can he hide himself with dozens of people staring at him? Just ask yourself the question, how can he hide himself when they're staring at him with stones in hand, ready to throw at him? And then it goes on, it says, and he went out of the temple going through the midst of these people. And he passed by. They're looking for him, they're looking to throw stones at him and can't find him. Now explain this to me. How can he suddenly hide himself and then walk through the middle of this crowd who have stones in hand to throw and they can't see him? And then it says, as he passed by, as he passed by who? The people with stones. 
looking for him to throw as he passed by. They see this guy born blind from birth. The disciples stop and say, Rabbi, who's in? They're having a Bible study there. He's surrounded by people with stones in hand that are looking for him to throw, and they can't see him. I can't explain it any more than you can. But the point is, if God has to make you invisible to keep you going, he does it. If God has to move mountains for you, he will. If God has to do what God has to do, he'll do what he has to do. Why not? You must stand before Caesar. You must finish your race. If you're, you know, if you've got years ahead of you, you've got years ahead of you. Don't let the devil take you out. Praise God. All right. Number six. Two more to go. Uh, same chapter, Acts 27. I'm sorry, go back to Acts 27. Same chapter we started with on these points, points five and six. Acts 27 and verse number 26 this time, 27, 26. Here's what it says. Paul talks to the sailors. Now he's talking to the soldiers after he shares with them the message from the angel. And he says to them, however, oh, let's begin with verse 25. 25 says, therefore take heart, men, for I believe God that it will be just as it was told to me. Verse 26, however, we must run aground on a certain island. Here's the point, point number six. We must allow for divine detours in our life. You and I must never forget God is piloting our ship. God is driving the car. We are not. And you have to be flexible and let God detour you around some things from time to time that you never anticipated or expected. See, let me say it to you this way. When Paul left Jerusalem, Malta was not on his list of places to visit along the way. They didn't even know where Malta was. Malta was a small island out in the middle of the Mediterranean, and the sailors didn't even know where it was. The Bible says when they saw the shoreline, they didn't even recognize this place. They didn't know where they were. But if you read the story, they crashed the boat on the beach. They all made it to shore safely, but they ended up with a three-month revival. Thousands of people got saved on Malta. Thousands of people got healed. Thousands of people got ministered to, and Paul didn't even know the place was there when he left Jerusalem heading to Rome. But God knew it was there. God knew there were people there. And you'll find in life from time to time, you will be maneuvered into, in, into unexpected places by the Holy Spirit to do unexpected things, ministering to people you never thought you'd meet, never thought you'd see, but you're there. It's not something you planned. It's not something you thought up. It's just where you are. So take advantage of the moment and minister to the people there. Amen? It's what I call divine detours, and there are plenty of them along the way. I've been in places where I never expected to be. I've been doing things I never thought I'd be doing, but I'm doing them, all right? I continue to use my faith. I continue to stand my ground and plan as best I can, but I always allow God the freedom to move me around as he sees fit because he sees ahead and I don't. Can anyone say amen? Amen. amen. I've had people, you know, they've had uh, ministry setbacks, you know, they're, they find themselves not where they think they ought to be, and I'll just tell them, you know, listen, maybe you, you're not where you think you should be right now, but you are somewhere, and there's people around you who need Jesus. Why don't you talk to them for a while? You just might get somebody saved that may turn around and win continence to the Lord. And you never would have met them unless you had taken your setback or experienced your disappointment or whatever the case may be. You know, just roll with the punches. Chill. And just let God be God. Can anyone say amen? amen. Hallelujah. You know, it's not where you plan to be, but this is where you are. Praise the Lord. Divine detours. Paul didn't expect to end up on Malta, but he sure did end up there. And because he did, many people were saved, many people were healed. Praise the Lord. God knows where to take us when he needs to take us there. All right. Final point, number seven. Look at John chapter number 30. I'm sorry, John chapter 3, verse 30, sorry. John chapter 3 and verse number 30. This is John the Baptist talking about Jesus. And he says to his staff, John says, he, this is a reference to Jesus, he must increase, I must decrease. Listen, the more you see things being done by God in your life, the more you realize how totally inadequate we are without God. 
the more I do what I see God doing, the more he empowers me, the more thankful I am he even chooses to use me. And as I move along life's way, I turned 60 years old a few months ago myself, you know, and, you know, you're just thankful to God that he's there. And I, I purpose in my heart to let him increase in my life just as, as much as I can to decrease as best I can and let God take over. Let God be God. Can anyone say amen? I'm nobody special and neither are you. You know, we do ourselves a great disservice when we start thinking we're somewhat among us. Somebody who seems to be someone among us. You know, these, these people that kind of parade around like spiritual peacocks, you know, with their feathers spread. Yeah, check me out. You know, I got this big church and check me out. I got this big ministry and check me out because I'm a singer and you got to listen to what I got to say. Listen, without Jesus, we're nothing. I mean zero. Nowhere. Nothing. Nada. We are naval lint without Jesus. Are you listening to me? We are insignificant specks. And, you know, you do yourself a service, praise God, when you, when you remind yourself of these things because the enemy will always come along and try to think you, make you think that you're better than you really are, more anointed than you really are. It's all you, and in reality, it's not us at all. It's just Jesus. We get to ride along. We get to go along for the ride. The more mature we become, the more we must let the Lord be the Lord in our lives. And when that happens, you take the pressure off yourself. And your life becomes the joy ride it's supposed to be in Christ, with or without the challenges, with or without the persecution. It can still be a joyful ride through life. Can anyone say amen? amen. Look with me, if you would, at uh, Hebrews chapter 4. Let's close up with some of these. Hebrews chapter number 4. In the Old Testament, there's all kinds of works that they had to accomplish in order to earn a hearing with God. You know, works, works, works. In the New Testament... There is only one work that is scriptural now in the New Testament for a believer. There's only one work that we're supposed to work, and it's found here in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse number 9. Here's the work of the New Testament church, the work of the New Testament believer. Hebrews 4, 9. It says, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Verse 10. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Verse 11, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of unbelief. All right? The Bible says we should be diligent to enter that rest. The King James says we labor to enter that rest. That's the only labor in the New Testament we're supposed to do. It's the labor of faith. It's the labor of entering into a place of rest and staying there. Not letting the stress of this world pull us back into works. Not letting the stress of this world pull us back into this, this running around like a chicken with its head cut off mentality. We got to do this, and then we got to do that, and then we got to do this, and then we got to see this done. Listen, we just let God be God. We let Him increase, we decrease, we get, you know, to come along, praise the Lord. It's wonderful, it's joyful, it's liberating, it's exciting, and it's scriptural. That's what Hebrews tells us and First Peter, you know, the verse that we all know so well, casting all your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Casting all your cares, all of them. Ask yourself tonight, have I done that? Have I cast all my cares? Am I carefree? Am I really carefree? Am I really trusting Jesus? Is he really increasing in my life like he should be? Am I decreasing? Am I trusting him more and more? Am I taking my hands off the wheel and letting God drive or not? Ask yourself. Because any worry, any fear, any trepidation, any anxiety is an indicator that we have not yet cast all of our cares upon the Lord like we're told to. If I cast my cares upon the Lord, I don't worry about anything. There's nothing to worry about. Would you agree that God knows where we are? God knows what's going on? Now, what is it about people? You know, when we pray, we, we, in the back of our mind, we sort of assume that we're informing God of things he doesn't know about. We're letting him know what's going on. You know, we're telling him. I, I've told people for years when I counsel with them as they struggle through sin and whatever, I said, listen, you need to confess your sins, come clean with God, and move on. Because when you confess your sins to God, it's not when he finds out about it. He already knows. So you might as well come clean. Start over, you know, you're only doing yourself a disservice if you fail to do that because he already knows what's going on. 
He knows where you go. He knows what you do. He knows what you think. He knows what your friends are. He knows where your priorities are. He knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. <laughs> you know, the point is, cast all your cares upon the Lord. Let him take care of you. Now, I, I say things like this, and people stare at me, but I love my wife. My wife is God's gift to me. Outside of Jesus, she's the best thing I ever had happen to me in my life. And I don't make any bones about it. Thank God for her. I love her so much, I don't care about her. Yeah, see, look, the, the silence. Everybody just stares at you like, what? You know, your golf ball eyes. Like, listen, I don't care about my family. I love my family. I do everything I can to provide for them, take care of them, feed them, clothe them, spiritually protect them, whatever and everything I can do. And at the end of the day, I don't care. Because I give it all over to the Lord. If he can't take care of them, who am I? I love my ministry, but I don't care about my ministry. I love my pastors, but I don't care about them. I love them enough to give them over to God. And as a result, I sleep peacefully at night. I don't lay, in wa lay awake uh, picking up lizards off the ceiling, you know, counting and seeing what's up there. And, you know, the point is just relax and let God be God. Can anyone say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Amen? Amen? Look at your neighbor and say, I don't care about you. <laughs> Just let that sink in for a moment. You know? <laughs> I don't care about you at all. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. It's a different paradigm, no doubt. But the point is, we are running a race, and there are things you must learn to do. These are the priorities, the things you need to do to make sure you finish the race you started to run on the day that you accepted Jesus. Can anyone say amen? amen? All right. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the word here tonight. We believe that this word was sown in good ground, and I praise and I thank you for this word. Help us all to be doers of this word and not just listeners only. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We will be doers of this word, and we will do what we must do in our lives to finish the race we run in strength and power and anointing from the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Now, hallelujah. Did this help anybody? I'm glad I came. Thank you, Lord. Listen, let's take care of kingdom business here for a few minutes, all right? If you're, you know, listen, don't, don't get up and run out. Let's give the Holy Spirit his just due. All right, there are people here tonight that need help, and that's what we're here for. That's what this church is here for, okay? Messages like this can encourage us, inspire us, instruct us even, but at the end of the day, what drives this church, what should drive every Christian is knowing that at least he's done or she's done their part to present the truth to people who may not know. And here's the truth. Jesus Christ, as we said at the beginning of this message, is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no other way. Being a good person is wonderful, but that's not salvation. Going to some other place to do some other thing, whatever, that's not salvation. you got to accept Jesus. And he stands at the door to every person's heart to knock. Now, he knocks, but you have to open the door. I can't open your door. You can't open mine. And he won't kick the door down. He stands at the door to every person's heart, and he asks you to open the door and invite him in. But you have to invite him in. No other way. I can't do this for you any more than you can for me. Now, if you're sitting here tonight and in the honesty of your heart, you know that you're not where you need to be with God. Either you've never accepted him, you've never come to Jesus and turned your life over to him like what we've talked about here tonight, or you at one time were on fire for the Lord and you have drifted away and now it's just I'm going through the motions. It's not as exciting as it once was. I'm not living and breathing Jesus like I used to. I don't read my Bible anymore. I, I just, you know, it's not like it once was. If that's you, I'm talking to you too. Either way, he's standing at the door to your heart and he's going to knock. And you have to open it up, okay? How do we do this? With our heart we believe and with our mouth we confess. We say something. We decide to do something. We decide to reach for the doorknob and we decide to open it up and invite Jesus to come in. That's how this is done. All right? This is very simple. This is not hard to understand. There's no process involved. All right? It's just a decision you make. Everybody, listen, we live in bodies. We are spirits living in bodies. 
I can't see you. I can only see the body you are presently living in. It's like a glove and a hand inserted into the glove. The glove is like the body and the hand is like the spirit within. When your body dies, you don't die. You go home. If Jesus is your Lord, home is where you go. You go up and you go home to heaven. If Jesus is not your Lord, home is down and that's where you're going to go. And everybody who dies and leaves their body and begins to descend, realizing where they're going, cry out. And they never get an answer because choice is on this side of death. This is where we have choice. Once you die, choice is removed from you. There is no choice on the other side. Choice is in this world. Choice is in this life. Now you have, a, you have the, the choice, the chance to choose. So choose. Don't walk out of here having passed by this opportunity to accept Jesus. Don't do that. Accept him. Receive him. Open the door. Let him in. He wants to help. All right? We'll count to three. When I reach the, the number three, you hear me say three and I clap my hands, I want you to shoot your hands straight up in the air. If you know I'm talking to you, no one's going to be staring at you. They're all dealing with the issues in their own life. No one's going to be looking at you, so never mind about any of that. One, two, three. When I clap my hands at the number three, you raise your hand to indicate, yeah, Mike, I need help. I want this church to help me turn my life around. I'm going to open the door to my life. I'm going to receive Jesus and get this thing back in order and turn my life around and start fresh. This will be the rest of the best day of the rest of my life. All right? Remember, everybody in hell, if they had one more chance to accept Jesus, they would all accept Jesus. But they'll never get the chance. So don't assume you have a tomorrow because tomorrow may never come for you. You could be hit by a truck tonight on your way home from church. How do you know? You're one breath away from eternity. Make sure you, you make this moment count right now. All right? One, remember it's by faith, not feelings. It's, just, it's a decision. It's not a feeling. Two, and no one can do this for you, just you. Three, put your hand up if anybody needs help. One, two, three, four, five, six. Anyone else? I'm looking around. Six, seven, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Jesus. Let's all stand. You've been sitting for a little while. If you did place your hand in the air. You know why you did. I don't know. I don't need to know. I'm not God, but I'm going to ask you to do something for me. If you did put your hand up, if that was something you did indicating I have a need in my life, I need Jesus in my life in a significant way, I want you to come out from where you were standing, where you're standing right now, come down to the front and let us minister to you for just a second. Would you please do that for me? Would you come on down to the front? Thank you. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Come on down. Thank you, Jesus. Come on down. Come on down. Thank you, Father. Come on down. Good for you. Come on. Don't let this opportunity pass you by. Come on down. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Anyone else? There they are. Praise God. Thank you, Father. Come on. We'll wait for you. Come on down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Praise the Lord. Amen. All right. Hallelujah. This is what heaven rejoices over right here. This is why this church is here. This is why we're all here. All of heaven rejoices for what's happening here in your lives. Jesus died for you. He died for you. You are who he died for. You can't fully understand the importance of the moment but we have trained people who can help you understand what's happening, what this means to you, how important this is to you, and how you can turn your life around through the decision you're making here tonight to receive Jesus like this, okay? So what I need for you to do is turn to your left. This gentleman here, Pastor Dave, would like to spend a few minutes with you just to pray with you. We have counselors to assist you, just to surround you with love and a little bit of understanding. If you came with friends or family, they'll wait for you. This won't take long, but it's important for us to tell you what this means where you go from here, okay? You know, when, when babies are born on operating tables, the doctor and all the staff don't clap and pat themselves on the back and go walk off somewhere and leave the kid on the delivery table. I mean, you know, they, they take care of the baby. And that's what we're doing here, and that's what we would love to do with all of you. So if you will take just a minute and go with this brother right here. And follow right there. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. 
Thank you, Lord.